Hello everybody, uh, this is Brother Luke, Sin City Preacher. Uh, welcome to this episode of Bible Talk with Brother Luke. Uh, this is episode number 22 as we study the topic of heaven. Uh, if you have not seen the first 21 episodes, uh, they are all available on my YouTube channel, Sin City Preacher. I hope you go back and watch them all. It's quite an endeavor because each episode is two hours long. So, so far we've already discussed heaven for 44 hours. <laughs> and I get a kick out of that because uh, uh, I don't think many people could uh, uh, carry on a conversation about heaven for more than 15 minutes before they've said everything they, they know. So, uh, uh, if you really want to know a lot more about heaven, go back and watch all those episodes. Uh, we're going to pick up where we left off last time. Uh, we are using this book by Randy Alcorn as, as our uh, study guide. The title is Heaven. The author is Randy Alcorn. And right today we're going to pick up in chapter uh, 30. Uh, but first let me introduce uh, uh, Brother Jackson who's uh, going to be discussing this with me today. You want to say hi and tell everybody about yourself? Hi there, I'm, I'm Jackson. My YouTube channel is Mecca Wing Zero. And uh, normally I'm really busy with school and I probably should even be working on my homework now, but I know I'm not going to do anything right now. So it'd be great to focus on what's eternal. Amen. Amen. Uh, yeah, and I, while you're mentioning that, I think that uh, uh, I know that Brother Mitch and, and, and myself, we've, we've said numerous times how wonderful it is to be able to talk about this particular subject of, of, of all theological subjects. I know of no other topic that brings me so much happiness as to study the, the, uh, what the scriptures promise us in, in eternity, uh, uh, our, our, our lives, eternal lives in heaven. Uh, as we learn about that, it's just such a joyful thing to study this subject. So, um, yeah, there's, there's a lot of great uh, topics uh, that we could choose to discuss, and, and I think all theological subjects I find interesting, but this one is interesting and, and joyful. All right, uh, one of the things I like about Randy Alcorn's book uh, is that he begins each chapter with a question, and then throughout the chapter he has follow-up questions. Uh, and he asks a question, and then he presents an, his answer to the question, and he uses scriptures to uh, uh, support his, his viewpoint. Uh, we don't always agree with every conclusion he makes, but uh, it's interesting for a discussion. And the question he starts in chapter 30 is, will we eat and drink on the new earth? Uh, first, before we get into his answer, Jackson, what's your first reaction to that? Have I would say probably, we probably do because of the, the, the lamb's feast. And uh, I doubt that'd be the last feast, is what I would say. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, obviously, some people uh, take things like that and, and many things about heaven as uh, uh, spiritualize it and say we shouldn't be taking it literally. But uh, I think a good rule of thumb is to always take the scriptures literally unless it's obviously should be spiritualized. Okay. Uh, Randy Alcorn writes, uh, words describing eating, meals, and food appear over a thousand times in Scripture, with the English translation uh, feast occurring another 187 times. Feasting involves celebration and fun, and it is profoundly re relational. Great conversation, storytelling, relationship building, and laughter often happen during mealtimes. Feasts, including Passover, were spiritual gatherings that drew direct attention to God, His greatness, and His redemptive purposes. Well, let me stop there and ask you, does it surprise you the number of times the scriptures refer to feasting? And, and uh, uh, you know, you, you gave you the first example that came to your mind, was the, the marriage supper of the Lamb. Uh, and, uh, but... Does it surprise you how often the Bible talks about feasting? And, and we're going to find the references feasting in eternity uh, is mentioned many times. 
Uh, it, it really doesn't surprise me because eating with people in that time when the Bible was written was very, uh, very much a part of getting to know them and, and building relationships with them. And one of the things I've always thought about heaven is that everyone's going to know everybody and everybody is going to be excellent friends with everybody and everything like that. So, mm -hmm. Yeah. Now, we're going to discuss as we go along uh, if there's a real need for food uh, uh, for our body's nutrition uh, or not. But um, uh, setting that aside for a moment, just the idea of eating food uh, is not only uh, just because our body requires it now, but when we eat, it, it is uh, it become a traditional thing throughout probably all of civilization that it's it's a social thing to do. Matter of fact, for many years, uh, I've been married 34 years now. For most of those years, the most social thing my wife and I did was we we go out to dinner to, and, and with e either the two of us or with other people, and it's a way of being social. Uh, uh, now, thankfully, she she loves to golf, so we have another recreational th activity that we can do and enjoy together. Uh, but eating is is a very social thing among all civilizations, isn't it? That's right. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, then he says, people who love each other like to eat meals together. Jesus said to his disciples, uh, "I confer on you a kingdom." just as my father conferred one on me, so that you may eat and drink at my table in my kingdom. Uh, scripture says, On this mountain the Lord Almighty will prepare a feast of rich food for all peoples, a banquet of aged wine, the best of meats, and the finest of wines. That's Isaiah. So, um, yeah, he's just... You're just making the same case that I did that pe people enjoy having meals together it's a part of our uh, civilization and uh, it's a great social thing and so will we continue this kind of social activity uh, in eternity uh, on the new earth uh, he, his next question is will we literally eat and drink so your your reaction, if I understand, is that you do take this literally. You don't you don't spiritualize this. That that this Mary's feast of the lamb and these other uh, verses we'll uh, discuss uh, should be spiritualized. I, I do. I think it is literal, and um, I think that if somebody has watched any of the previous ones or a lot of the previous ones, we've talked about where a lot of the over spiritualization comes from, like with Christoclatonism and all that stuff. Yeah, yeah. That's a that's a term that is kind of a, we've we've discussed throughout all of these episodes because it it became it's given people such a false impression of um, our eternal state of existence, thinking that uh, in eternity it must be some non physical, spiritual, ethereal existence rather than uh, with with physical bodies on a physical earth with physical uh, things like food uh, so uh, that was that's been kind of the common misconception within the church I, I bet you Jackson if if you go to any congregation you start asking people to tell you about what the, how they describe heaven and ask them things like this you know about bodies and meals and stuff uh, how do you think they will describe it to you many of them would probably not even have thought about it enough to even answer, but my guess is they would all have a negative, uh, maybe not negative, but uh, opposite idea of of any of this being literal and physical. Yeah. First of all, they'd probably be unaware of these scriptures anyway, and mm -hmm. and then if they if they are aware, they dis dismiss it and think that. Well, it's mis you're just misunderstand because we're just going to be like angels. We're going to be some spirit beings uh, in some spirit realm. They they have no idea that uh, uh, that, uh, that with Christoplatonism is is basically introducing the idea from Plato, uh, from Greek philosophy, and from Gnosticism that the physical world is evil and the spiritual realm is is uh, good, 
and uh, so therefore in eternity our existence must be completely spiritual with no physical reality because the physical realm is all evil uh, and so they think that uh, everything about heaven must be spiritualized okay he says um, if we don't have intermediate bodies then we won't eat in the intermediate heaven first let let's back up for a moment what does he mean by intermediate bodies and the intermediate heaven? He means like if we die before Christ returns, where we go as, as Christians. Yes. Um, um, many episodes ago we discussed the idea that uh, people who are in heaven right now, and if you and I died right now and we go to heaven, this is an intermediate uh, state of heaven, and that uh, that heaven will actually be come down on the earth and become in the eternal existence part of the new earth uh, the new Jerusalem heaven will come down and become one with earth and that will be that will be the our existence throughout eternity but until that happens uh, we have people in heaven right now and Randy Alcorn refers to this as the intermediate heaven so we've speculated in the past that uh, do these people have physical bodies in the intermediate heaven right now and we're We've, uh, we haven't come to a like real definite conclusion on that, but I, I'm leaning towards uh, they have some kind of intermediate bodies, and if so, uh, uh, you wonder, well, will they eat? Are they eating in heaven right now? Or is there any need for that? But he says, if we do not have temporary bodies, uh, we might eat, but not necessarily. However, it's interesting that manna is referred to as the bread of angels unquote that's in Psalms chapter 78 when angels and God himself took on human form they ate human food that's Genesis chapter 18 in the present heaven is the tree of life uh, from which God says overcomers may eat in uh, Revelation 2 7 uh, perhaps they won't eat from it until it's on the new earth Nevertheless, the fact that a tree with possibly edible fruit is currently located in the immediate heaven is at least raises the question of whether people can eat now there. However, since it's pre-resurrection, it seems likely there's no eating in the present heaven. Do you think that that's uh, uh, is that a conclusion that you will agree with, or you uh, you lean otherwise? Uh. I would have to think more about it. I initially tend to agree, though, because it, I, I can't see anything that I can think of in Scripture that would contradict that offhand. Well, you remember that we, we uh, concluded that uh, uh, we, we, the tree of life existed in the Garden of Eden, and oh. now in script, Scriptures tell us that there is a tree of life already in heaven presently. So Randy's referring back to that, saying that even in the intermediate heaven, there's, there's this tree of life. Uh, and we know that the tree of life and the, the heaven um, will come down and become part of the earth in, in eternity. So then that tree of life will exist uh, here on earth. Um, but if it, if it is uh, there in heaven, as we think, uh, and, it's, and there's fruit on it, uh, we can't really say whether people are eating of it now or not, or we can only uh, guess. There's nothing really that says one way or the other that I know of, is there? Does the Bible say that Adam and Eve did not eat of the tree of life? Uh, no, it doesn't say that they did or, or they didn't as far as I know. I'm, it, it may say that they w did eat from it, but I'm not positive. Uh, when, when they were kicked out of the garden, didn't God say, the, the, the something like the effect of that they can't eat of it now, the tree of life? Yeah, uh, when they ate uh, from the other tree, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, and uh, that was the fall of man, they were exiled from paradise, and cherubim were placed to guard so that they could not get back in, so that they could not have access to the tree of life and then have eternal life. So if they if they had eaten the, or the tree of life, if they could have gotten back in there, they would have gotten saved then? Uh, they would have become immortal, I guess. Interesting. Mm -hmm. The scriptures say that that's, that's what, why the cherubim were placed there, to prevent them from eating it and gaining immortality. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, he goes on to say, strangely, however, many people also believe we won't eat or drink in the eternal heaven. 
They assume the biblical passage, uh, biblical language about eating and drinking and banquets is figurative, and that we'll, we will eat. Uh, oh, let me skip that because I've, I've forgot. I made notes in the book of parts I wanted to cover and parts I want to skip because that's kind of just redundant. Now, now, go. Let's move on to this next question. How will food taste? Any any uh, initial feeling on that? I assume very very good. <laughs> I would think so. Uh, I think it'll be not only very good, but uh, I suspect it'll be better than the the, the food that we have in this uh, fallen world. But Randy Alcorn says, only two people live before the fall. This means only two people have ever eaten food at its best, with their capacity to taste it at its best. The great wine Christ made and served at the wedding of Cana was a foretaste of that best of wines he will provide for us on the new earth. Even in this cursed world, scripture is filled with more feasts than fasts. Uh, who created our taste buds? Who determined what we like and what we don't? God did. The food we eat is from God's hand. Our resurrected bodies will have resurrected taste buds. We can trust that the food we eat on the new earth, some of it familiar and some of it brand new, will taste better than anything we've ever eaten here. Um, well, the one thing about Randy Alcorn in his book is he seems to uh, formulate an opinion on pretty much everything. And... Uh, a lot of his opinions he supports quite well with scripture and some of it there's no scripture to back it up it's just kind of like a, a logical conclusion I guess it's a, and then yeah, kind, of like, kind of like Bob Wilkins view on where babies who die brought being brought back in the millennium yeah I, I'm not familiar with that but yeah a lot of people speculate and we we, we, we draw conclusions just based on, on basically uh, deductive logic of we first we know uh, the character of God, his qualities of, of mercy, justice, love, and and uh, so on, and and then we then we we kind of uh, analyze things and and speculate on how things will be, even though we don't necessarily have scripture to give us a strong con conclusion to back it up. And those things are, it's I think it's fine to do that as long as we don't get dogmatic about it and start uh, uh, saying, "Thus saith the Lord." That uh, preaching it like it's uh, you know it's scripture. Um, so, but the taste bud idea that he's putting forth here that uh, our taste buds will be enhanced since uh, do you, we've talked about last time about how perhaps or maybe our vision will be improved and our sense of smell, all of our senses. Not only that, our five senses may be much greater. But maybe we'll even have additional senses that we have no idea about now. Um, and uh, uh, so here we have the sense of taste that he's talking about. And, and Randy's uh, asserting that our taste buds will be greatly enhanced. So if, that, if our taste buds are greater and the food is, is uh, perfect food because it's, it's not in the, from a fallen world, then Randy's making a logical assumption that uh, we will enjoy food more, it'll taste better. Right, right. Okay, so the next question is, will we eat meat? And that's my question to you, brother. What's your, your first reaction to that? Will we eat meat in, it, in, in eternity on the new earth? Um... I think we will really during the millennium because it talks about animal sacrifices coming back symbolically. Mm -hmm. But um, as far as eternity, I mean, maybe maybe there'll be something that looks and tastes just like meat, but actually isn't because I I have a I have kind of a hard time imagining animals dying all the rest of eternity. Then again, plants are are living and then die too. Mm -hmm. it, I'm wondering that, you know, sometimes people seem to think it's perfectly okay for plant life to die, 
uh, and and we don't have, we don't make that an issue when we look at the scripture that says there will be no more death. Uh, and we think well, plant life doesn't count for some reason. Uh, mm -hmm. and, and then, but animal life we elevate above plant life and and saying that we think as you just said, well maybe plant li animal life is superior to uh, plant life, and therefore uh, there will be no more death of animals. Uh, uh, or maybe some people say, no, there will be death of animals, but the the, the, the no 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 more death saying only applies to to human beings. Right. So you're you're uh, I guess standing on the uh, making the case that that animals will no longer suffer death. Well, I'm not necessarily making the case of that, but that would be my guess, is what I would say. Okay. Well, Randy has an opinion. Let's see what he says. It appears that people didn't eat meat until after the flood. When right. God said, quote, everything that lives and moves will be food for you. Just as I gave you the green plants, I now give you everything. That's Genesis 9.3. Randy says, it makes sense that people wouldn't eat meat before the fall, when living beings didn't die. But why weren't animals eaten before the fall and the flood? Perhaps it was still unthinkable, so close to Eden. Uh, the genealogies of Genesis 5 indicate that Noah's father, Le Lamech, I guess that's how you say Lamech, Lamech, uh, was born before Adam died. Perhaps animals still held a rem remnant of intelligence not yet sufficiently dissipated by the fall. So what the, what is the case he's making so far here then that uh, uh, re, he's going back to Genesis? Now is is Randy Alcorn a young Earth creationist? Um, I I can't recall if in the book he really spells that out. Uh, I don't think he he uses that kind of terminology. I, I'd have to conclude it just based upon the 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 way that he's describing things. Uh, but I I think he probably would be. I'm assuming that um, unless unless maybe he was one of the uh, old Earth with the gap theory because. Uh, um, I, I, I don't want to say for sure, but uh, here he's he's referring back to the idea that uh, at one point in time, Scripture says man only ate animal life, and then after the after, uh, then you had the fall, and they still only let ate animal I mean plant life. Only at the after the flood with Noah did God say eat animals, not just plants. Now, uh, so. does that mean that that people didn't eat meat, or just that it was it was before that God didn't approve of eating meat? I wonder. That's a very interesting point. Uh, because, um, because you know there was there there during the days of Noah, people were were rebelling against God and everything. Mm -hmm. And it, I guess would it wouldn't surprise me if some of them maybe. We're eating meat because when 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 Noah was told by God that you could eat meat, it didn't seem like it seems like um it wasn't like I'm going to introduce a new way of getting food or something like that. It was more like I'm allowing something. Yeah, I, I'm really glad you asked that question. I, I, it's a question that I, I I had never thought of, and I think it's a really interesting. Uh, my my reaction initially is is just I just don't know I have no clue uh, if maybe they could could have been some people could have been eating meat uh, before God sanctioned it, but what we do know from the scripture is that God at one point told man to eat plant life, and, and there's no there's no uh, declaration or saying thou shalt not eat animal life, but but it does say that that he's given us the plant life to eat to Adam and Eve. Uh, and, and then after the fall, uh, there's still no change in this. Uh, and only only after the flood is there a change where God also says, in addition to plant life, you can have animals for food. So, uh, but Randy's speculating that uh, maybe that uh, uh, 
people wouldn't have thought of eating animal life uh, be because animals were superior uh, in, in, cre in original creation to what we have now. Animals have also suffered in the fall and, and uh, maybe animals didn't even eat each other at that point. And therefore, um, uh, man's viewpoint would be the idea of eating animals who are almost like people. It would be like uh, repulsive and just, you know, uh, unthinkable. But then uh, uh, and so much time has passed is what he's alluding to here. So much time has passed from the fall to the flood that over time, uh, that much time, uh, maybe maybe the idea of eating e eating animal life was was not so shocking to people. Uh, he says, uh, as mentioned in chapter twelve, some people argue that animals died before the fall, but this conclusion seems to be driven by assumption about the Earth's age. And, interpre and interpretations of the fossil record, not from biblical texts. Scripture ties all death to Adam. Sin, in, quote, sin entered the world through one man and death through sin. That's Romans 5.12. The, cre the, the creation was subjected to frustration, unquote, and is, quote, in bondage to decay because of humanity's sin and will be delivered through humanity's resurrection. That's Romans chapter 8. Whether blessing or curse, whether life or death, what is first true of mankind then extends to animals. This suggests animal death did not precede human death. What did not precede human death? Animal death yeah. did not precede human death. Hmm. Well, um, uh, in the genealogies, uh, I mean, there's many people referenced to how old they were when they when they died, um, but I, I don't think it's a complete list. I, mean, I think there are a lot of other people that may have died m at a much younger age, uh, either through uh, for whatever whatever reason, either health or uh, accident or murders. Uh, so I, I imagine that people were dying off ever since uh, Cain. I mean, and Abel. Uh, but, but animals, he's, he's asserting here that animals never would, would have died either. Not only did man not have death, but animals did not have death until uh, the fall. He says, if animal death preceded human sin and death, so did animal suffering. Indeed, advocates of this position picture not only animals devouring and killing each other before the fall, but also people eating animals. But how does this reconcile with Genesis 9-3, where God says, just as I gave you the green plants, I now give you everything. Emphasis added. So it, it, it's, um, it's clear that God did not sanction man to eat animals until Genesis 9-3, after the flood. Yeah, but you introduced a question that An uh, that uh, Randy didn't really say. I mean, actually, he is saying it here that uh, he, he did said. Uh, and also, pe people eating animals. Here, here he actually makes the same case that you asked when your question. Uh, Jackson, mm -hmm. he says, he says, if animal death preceded human sin and death, so did animal suffering. Indeed, advocates of this position picture not only animals devouring and killing each other before the fall, but also people eating animals. So your question here is not something that Randy has. Uh, uh, well, I think I think. Uh, if we're going to stick to a literal interpretation of the early uh, passages of the Bible, it's clear that God didn't sanction um, man eating animals, but but uh, until after Noah. But that does. But people do all kinds of things. God doesn't sanction. Yeah. So 
very interesting. I never really even uh, dreamed up this idea before. I've never even contemplated such a thing. But I, I guess I can't rule it out from scriptures because scripture does not really speak about it. So I, I can't say it's, it couldn't have happened. Okay. Uh, because does, does Randy think then that animals eating each other, like snakes eating mice, you know, frogs eating flies, etc., happened after the fall? Or was uh, it did not come until after the flood? I doubt he would say that. Hmm. Uh, no, I don't think he does say that at all. And I, I don't think in the scriptures that uh, uh, it, it's, it says anything about that that I know of. Uh, we do know that there was no death for man, and we, I'm assuming that there was also no death for animals until after the fall. But now after the fall, uh, animals and man did suffer death. So did animals start eating each other at that time? I, I think that it's a logical assumption that that, 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 that was the case. Uh -huh. But did man also eat animals? Scripture doesn't speak on it, does it? No. Okay. Now, Randy says, would God, God call, quote, very good a realm in which animals suffered, died, and devoured one another? Surely the repeated redemptive promise that one day animals will live in peace with each other is at least to a degree a return to Edenic conditions, though it's certainty more than that. Uh, that's in Isaiah 11, chapter 11. If, as I believe, animal death was the result of the fall and the curse, uh, once the curse has been lifted on the new earth, animals will no longer die just as they fell under mankind. So they will rise under mankind. This suggests people may eat, may become vegetarians on the new earth as they apparently were in Eden during the time before the flood. So all that to make the case uh, to, that the on the new earth mankind will not be eating animals. We will return to the, the um, way of eating in Eden. And it looks like uh, Brother Austin's here, huh? Hey, Austin. Hey, how are you guys doing? We're doing great. We're trying to figure out, you know, what we're going to be eating in, in uh, on the New Earth. Right, right. I heard about this be, uh, before I ran into it with uh, we can't eat animals anymore. I can, can understand you? why, though. How about turning your volume up a little, Brother Austin? Sure, hang on. Let me uh, let me find my volume control. I can. I got a control here too, but I can, can make it. But I'd rather have you do it. Can you hear me now? Yeah, it's just a little better. Let me maybe what okay. I'll do is I'll I'll turn your volume up a little bit. Okay, go ahead and talk now. Hey. Okay, that's better. I turned your volume up. Okay. Okay. Uh, yeah, I was just right. saying about. I, I was just saying about the animals. Uh, I remember reading that that it's. I, I think, I think the reason, main reason why that's happening is just because it won't be violent. Uh huh. We well, the, the other idea is in it. It says there will be no more death. Uh, but we we've been talking about this idea of death now, and applying to man, animals, and plant life. Now we know that plant life will continue to 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 die. Uh, so we, we've dismissed that as, as some lower form of life that does not fall under this decree. There will be no more death. Uh, but what about animals? Will there be death uh, with animals, or, or, or will they continue living as they did in the garden too before the fall? If that's the case, we certainly will not be butchering them and, eat, and feasting on them, will we? Sure. Oh, absolutely. Okay. Okay. Uh, and they also, I forgot, they also won't eat each other uh, as well. They'll be eating like grass and uh, herbs and fruits and vegetables. Yes, yeah. There are scriptures that say that. We'll be getting to that, I think. Okay, so then Randy says... Thing to have a herbivorous snake. <laughs> that, that's one thing about snakes, is there's actually not a single species of snake that's even an omnivore. They're all strictly carnivorous. Yeah. Yeah, that's interesting. My favorite animal. So. Yeah. 
Well, I, I personally, I'm not very fond of insects, so I, I'm wondering if they're going to still be insects, and, and if, if there are, if the uh, they can be acceptable form of uh, food for, for the, some of these animals, like snakes and birds. Yeah, hopefully mosquitoes actually, won't bite you Yeah, it, actually, that's really interesting you bring up that point, Lou, because I remember reading that young earth creationists actually differed on whether insects died before the fall or not, whether that qualified as that kind of life that they think or not. Yeah, I've, I've never heard anybody talk about that. It's just like one of these, I read that one one idea that came to my mind just now. I never even tried to divide insects from other forms of, of animal life. Okay, so Randy next says, uh, how then should we understand this great text? Quote, on this mountain, the Lord Almighty will prepare a feast of rich food for all peoples, a banquet of aged wine, the best of meats and the finest of wines, Isaiah 25, 6. One possibility is that this refers to the millennium, where Christ reigns, but the world is still under the curse, and therefore animals still die. The other possibility is that it refers to the new earth, uh, but we are told on the new earth there will be no more death or pain for the old, old order of things has passed away, Revelation chapter 21. The text doesn't specify no more human death or pain. So his, that's an interesting point. Uh, what do you think of that verse that says uh, the best of meats and the finest of wines in, at this banquet? Isn't sometimes isn't fruit related to meat? Uh, that's a very good point. Uh, uh, what do you think, uh, Jackson? Is that is that a, a proper use of the term meat? Um, it, it, uh, it, this is getting into semantics, obviously. Yeah, but but it's also it is an acceptable use of the of the word, though. Uh, I think so. Um, to, I mean, meat, of course, can, you can talk about even even a sentence, the meat of the argument. Right. right. Like, like, I would think the meat of a, of a uh, mango is be the really tender part of it in the inside. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah, that's a very good point. Uh, I thought of that, too, when I first read this from Randy about meat being more than uh, a broader word than just animal flesh. Okay. I wonder what the word wines there means. What's that? I wonder if, what the word wines there means exactly, too, because I can imagine a lot, a lot of um, Christians think drinking is wrong, period. Well, uh, I know I've heard people argue that uh, wine uh, that Jesus drank was just grape juice. It was not alcoholic. And, and I... Uh, I can you think of any scientific thing in the Bible that would show you that it, that could not be the case? Well, didn't they have to ferment wine to get the bacteria out of it? Or um, I, I don't know. I, I, I'm sure they drank just grape juice, be, which is it's the same thing as wine before it, it uh, sours and, and starts fermenting. So they would drink it before and after, but how do we know from Scripture, that the the wine that Jesus drank and the the, the wine that he referred to was actually war, alcoholic wine. How do we know that? Well, as you said, Brother Luke, you made a key point. It could also be referenced to you said grape juice. It could also be referenced to just simply juice, like fine yeah. juices. Yeah, it could be. But my question is: Is there anything in Scripture that you can think of? Because I have, I have an answer in, in my mind right now for it. I'm just wondering if you guys have thought of this, or maybe you'll be surprised. You, you won't be surprised when I tell you the answer. Is it partly the context of the of what happened there, where they said normally we have the the fine wines first as people get more and more drunk, but this time we've got the best for last. I've never thought that our grape juice really fits into the context of that telling. Yeah, I, I think that is a, uh, a good um, case to make, but I, I wouldn't argue that from a scientific point of view. I'm talking about something in Scripture that we can show through, through a scientific argument that makes this case. 
I'm sorry, brother. I, it fades my mind. Okay, here I'll tell you. It's uh, to me. I I thought of this uh, just within this last year, discussing this with someone else. And, and the, the you remember when Jesus talked about the wine skins? He said, "You do not put uh, new wine into an old wine skin because it will burst, tear it open." You know. So the the reason for that is because when you the way they did it is. Uh, they would have the wine skin stretch because uh, when you put the grape juice in it and then it starts um, um, turning into wine, uh, it, it would be, uh, uh, cause a gaseous uh, reaction that would cause the, it to expand, the wine skin to expand. Now it expands to a certain point. Uh, if it expands too much, of course, then it'll burst. So if you put wine in, uh, and then it expands, and now you have a wine, spin, wine skin that's old. It's already been stretched out. You don't you don't put any more new wine. You only put old wine in it because the old wine is not going to to stretch it out anymore. But if you put new wine into an old wine skin, the new wine hasn't fermented, and when it ferments, it will cause this gas to expand, and the old wine can't stretch any further, so it will burst. So to me, that's that's a scientific proof that that they were actually talking about uh, alcoholic fermented wine, not just pure, you know, fresh grape juice. Hmm. Were you able to follow along with? Did I did I explain that clearly enough to make sense or not? Definitely. What's that? Definitely, I said. Okay. All right. So the question he's Randy's asking here is about meat. Um, Let's go on. He says, so how could there be meat without animal death? Many people, I'm not one of them, eat meat substitutes and prefer the taste to real meat. Uh, how hard would it be for God to create far better substitutes that do qualify as meat in every sense of taste and texture without coming from dead animals? This may stretch the meaning of meat and may seem unnatural, but wouldn't it be more natural than animals dying when we're told there will be no more death? What do you think of Randy's argument in that case? Is he basically saying that meat will just be, be available without death? You're saying? Is he saying? Or? He, he's, he's saying that rather than... If, if we believe that there will be no more death means not only man, but no more animal death then we cannot be eating meat from animals. It would have to be some form of uh, animal substitute type that would, thing that we refer to as meat. What do you that think? That sounds reasonable to me. It seems reasonable? Mm-hmm. Austin, what do you think? I hate veggie burgers. Yeah, I don't know. I, he's trying to, you know, he's trying to come up with some answer that's reasonable. Uh, Jackson accepts it as reasonable. Austin says, I hate veggie burgers, but this is the interesting thing. It may, you got to realize heavenly food, right before Austin came on the show, we were talking about how it's going to be so much better, True. probably, than yeah. anything else. And so the meat substitute of heaven could be much, much better than real meat here. Yeah. Because I agree, I like real meat, but I'm not, I wouldn't say I hate veggie burgers, but I like real meat better. So, well, uh, I'm not going to say that it's uh, this is an impossible point that he's making. It couldn't possibly be the case, but I, I think he's just really, really, uh, it's a reach. It's a reach to use that that kind of reasoning and argument. So, uh, I don't have a better answer. Um, I, I think to me maybe the best answer might be the what Austin brought up to the fact that. The, the word meat doesn't necessarily mean animal flesh. We can refer to the flesh of, of fruit as meat sometimes, the meat of the peach, the meat of the melon. Uh, so I don't think it's necessarily when it says meat that it has to necessarily be animal. I, I would lean more towards that side than the artificial animal uh, meat, uh, meat substitute that, he, that Randy is talking about. That's just me, though. I don't have a. I don't really feel strongly one way or the other on this. Hey, real fast. What would the uh, sea life? What would they eat? Algae and seaweed and stuff. 
Uh, yeah, and it, and then it also boils down to where do you draw the line as far as res, d, applying this statement? There will be no more death. Uh, it, it it obviously uh, uh, animal plant life will die. There will still be seasons. The leaves will die off off of trees. There will be some form of of death. Grass may may die. Uh, <clears throat> so and, and maybe if animals are eating, if we are eating uh, animals and humans are eating vegetation then that vegetation has to die so we we don't apply there will be no more death to, to plant life now the next argument is what about insects what about animal lo, lo, lower forms of animal life than human and then finally we know that it doesn't apply to human so uh, it just depends on how far you want to apply the statement there will be no more death and that's what we're trying to, uh, to d determine uh, so animal sea life uh, will will the big fish still eat the little fish, or will they all just eat the plankton? Right. I don't know. Or will there be uh, substitute animals that the substitute meat comes from? <laughs> uh, what is that? <laughs> what, I was going off of the substitute meat argument. What if wow. there were also substitute animals that don't really actually have any blood? But they kind of move around, sort of like fishing bait does, and they yeah. eat them. But yeah. they actually are nutritious and everything. <laughs> I, I don't know. I'm I'm anxious to find out what what it's going to be. But uh, I expect it's we're going to really enjoy it. Whatever this, whatever this meat is, I think I think we're going to thoroughly enjoy it. That'd be interesting. It's vegan, but it still moves around and runs around, and it's it's not yeah. just. <laughs> one of our one of our friends here uh, on YouTube. Um, uh, he used to be called uh, American Wayne, and now he's uh, now he's known as the Vegan Preacher. He's become a vegan. He he's getting healthier and losing weight and stuff. But he's quite adamant against uh, eating animals. Not, and it's not even for the nutrition's sake as much as it is the moral morality of it. Uh, that's that's his uh, position. But uh, um, I'm I'm sure that a lot of people that feel that way will. We'll be happy that uh, you know we'll be returning to some um, vegetarian type of diet. Uh, uh, during now, brother Eric, who's not with us today, you know, he's talked several times about how much he loves steak, and and he he really wants to continue enjoying to eat meat. You know, uh, I, I like to eat meat, but meat over the last few years is you know the amount of meat in my diet is kind of way 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 down. Is I don't. I haven't ruled it out completely, but I eat a lot less. I just it's not as uh, appealing to me as it used to be. So who knows? Maybe our desires and our tastes will be totally different, and we won't even have the desire for for that for animal flesh. I think that's the best thing in any per perspective. If something that somebody likes, and if we just didn't have that urge to act upon it anymore, I think that would that would help. Because I know that there's a lot of areas people would absolutely need that. In order to comply, we get that urge or that feeling taken out of our uh, our brain, so we don't have to indulge. Yeah, anymore. I know that uh, you know a lot of people. We spend a lot of time talking to people about um, even now in in this present state of existence. You have people who are Christians, and uh, they have uh, desires to sin, and. Uh, we probably all have our own uh, basic proclivities for sins. Uh, the things that might appeal to me that are sinful may be totally different than, than, than sinful things that are appealing to you. Uh, everybody has their own uh, different proclivities. Uh, but I know that after I got saved, many of my desires in life changed, and not, not because I made any uh, effort of my own. It's just that God, over time, has changed my, a lot of my desires. And so if he can change my desires in this present state, how much more can he change my desires in eternity when I have a glorified body without a sin nature? Amen. Okay, he, Randy goes on to say, uh, during the millennium or on the new earth uh, or both, fishermen will spread their nets and catch fish. That's Ezekiel 47. Either this is catch and release purely for sport, <laughs> or it suggests fish will still be eaten. Jesus ate fish in a resurrected body. However, that was on a, an unresurrected earth, still under the curse. 
hunting and killing animals is legitimate and sometimes necessary on the present earth. However, to the degree that hunting animals involves their fear, suffering, or death, it wouldn't fit with the biblical description of the new earth, where not only people but also animals live in peace and harmony. Quote, the wolf and the lamb will feed together and the lion will eat straw like the ox. They will neither harm nor destroy. That's Isaiah chapter 65. We're told animals' eating habits will change. Why not ours? There's a lot to consider in that statement there, huh? So on one hand, in Ezekiel, it says that we're going to be catching fish, and then Jesus actually ate fish in his resurrected, glorified body. And then the lion and the lamb will become vegetarians. Uh, Maybe we'll become pescatarians. Who knows? Pescatarians? <laughs> yeah. We're not going to eat pest like uh, you know uh, mealworms. Pescatarians are vegetarian who includes fish and seafood in their diet. Oh, okay. That's from that's from that. Uh, I know. I pesca is isn't that the. Uh, Horoscope sign of Pisces. Yeah, I, I don't know if there's any connection there. I just know that that term pescatarian. Yeah, well, it just sounds like pesca is is comes from and Pi, Pisces or from the same root word. I, I'm guessing, uh, and Pisces has the sign of the fish. See, I, I wonder if, if snakes. Talking about snakes, like garter snakes, eat little fish. I had one, and I'd buy little fish, and it would go and go in its water bowl and hunt them down and stuff. Yeah, I don't know, but here, what, I'm, I'm, I'm a little confused. I, I, what, what are you guys going to do with these verses? Uh, it says that in Ezekiel, that in the future we'll be fi catching fish. We saw that Jesus actually ate fish, even though he had a glorified body. And when then we also uh, know that there will be no more death. So is, is fish not considered uh, a class of a life that, that is, uh, uh, is, is such a low form of life that it's not counted like, like a lamb or a lion or a goat or a sheep or a wolf? Maybe, maybe it's what I said. They're vegan fish. They vegan can't fish? Kill anything. <laughs> Remember? <laughs> I don't know. We're hunting the killer veggies here. Yeah, I think we're going to have some surprises because it's hard for me to really have any real conclusions on exactly what we're going to be eating. I know that we're going to be eating plant life and you know vegetable 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 life, but uh, this meat, I'm not I'm not so sure. But maybe fish will be our meal. Maybe we'll be, as you say, pescatarians. Pescatarians. And that's I don't like the word though. Pescatarian. It sounds like. We'll be eating pests like uh, pesticides, like insects. <laughs> well, we might do that too. Who knows? Like yeah. John the Baptist. Yeah. Uh, I, I tell you what, I, I think I'd starve to death before I started eating insects, though. And, and right now, if I had to choose. The food chain may seem natural to us, but I believe it violates God's original design. No more curse and death means no more food chain involving living creatures. As radical a shift as that may seem, it will likely be a return to God's original design. So on the new earth, we may consume a wonderful array of fruits and vegetables, perhaps supplemented by meat that doesn't require death, something that tastes better but isn't animal flesh, if the product of the curse and death can taste good to fallen taste buds, how much better will God's specialty, specially designed food smell and taste to resurrected senses? Yeah, I actually, I actually am kind of glad that there's that thing about fish in there because I love sushi. It's probably yeah, my too. second favorite kind of food. Hey, listen, when you come to Vegas to visit me someday, we'll go out and have some sushi together. That'd be wonderful. <laughs> Yeah, should, no, I, should, I absolutely love sushi. That sounds like a heavenly idea. Yeah, well, I got some great all-you-can-eat sushi places here. Uh, yeah. Should we invite Austin or not? Absolutely. I'm sure, I'll you, be there. If he's Austin, if he likes sushi. Did you so. how Did you hear how quickly Jackson offered to include you? Yeah. That's wonderful. 
That, that's that's filial love, Philadelphia. In Las Vegas. <laughs> In Sin City. Okay. Uh, so now the next question that uh, Randy asks in the book is, should we look forward to feasts? He says, you and I have never eaten food in a world untouched by the fall and the curse. The palate and taste buds were injured in the fall, as were all food sources. The best tasting food we've ever eaten wasn't nearly as good as it must have tasted in Eden or as it will on the new earth. The person who's eaten the widest variety of meals on earth still hasn't tasted countless others. How many special dishes will you discover on the new earth? As yet, you may not have tasted your favorite meal, and if you have, it didn't taste as good as it will there. The best meals you've ever eat, you'll ever eat are still ahead of you on the new earth. Uh, I was just thinking about the sushi as I was reading that. Uh, I think, I, I hope it's not going to be California rolls, right? Yeah. Yeah, no California rolls. I like spicy tuna rolls, spider rolls. Well, rolls are pretty good, but I, I, I like uh, salmon maki. And I like yellowtail maki a lot too. Yeah, do you like the big the comp, the big rolls? They're like complicated things, or just the simple things, the real simple, uh, like ahi on on uh, on rice, you know? I like both a, a lot. Yeah. I usually in order of each. So yeah. Okay. Um, now he says on Las Vegas. He concludes here. If it seems trivial or unspiritual to anticipate such things, remember that it's God who promises that on the new earth we will sit at tables, at banquets and feasts, and enjoy the finest foods and drinks. And to top it off, our Father promises that He Himself will prepare for us the finest foods. That's Isaiah chapter 25. Don't you think He wants us to look forward to eating at His table? Yeah, I don't think that we've had any really good uh, conclusions uh, in this discussion on food. I think there's been a lot of ideas discussed and speculation here, but I don't really feel like firmly convinced on on, on, the, on our diet uh, in eternity. Uh, but he's, his real conclusion here is, should we be looking forward since God talks about this feast that he's going to have for us and that he's going to be feasting with he's preparing a special feast for us so is it good for us to really in, you know joyfully anticipate it and really look forward to it yeah I'm, I'm really looking forward to this, uh, this marriage feast I'm looking forward to it yeah okay so now we move to chapter 31 and the question uh, Randy asks at the beginning of this chapter is, will we be capable of sinning on the new earth? No. Um, I mean, obviously we're going to all say no, right? Yeah. Right. Uh, we're going to say no. I mean, if that's the immediate answer that comes to our head, but there's a lot more to discuss on this uh, to, to uh, support what, we're, what we believe. Uh, and a lot of things uh, to ponder here. Randy says, people have said to me, quote, heaven will be perfect, but a sinless environment doesn't mean we can't sin. Adam and Eve proved that. They lived in this sinless place, yet they sinned. What's your reaction to that? Well, hang on. Now, now this is interesting here because I also have to take into account during the millennial, when Satan's let off his chain, he deceives the world again. And this was described by... Now, keep in mind, I, I have no idea on this, but this is just how it was explained to me. The pastor said at the time that we dwell with uh, other human beings, I guess, and these human beings aren't saved yet when Christ reigns. So when he's let off his chain, he deceives them. But we're still fine because we're always saved. But the question then came to be is that how are so human beings come back? Do they do the same things that human beings did before? Do they give and take in marriage and do they eat animals and I mean because this is kind of a confusing concept because if he, if he gets off he can't de he can't deceive the saints because the saints are saved forever and we know who Christ is and 
I'm also confused too is that how can you deceive the world if everybody knows Christ and he's the one who rules the world I'm lost on why they would fall away because I, I know it's not just a small number it's a very it's a very significant number it's almost the majority of the world again but uh, yeah I think that this is a highly possible statement is that sin will probably be there because well it's evidence that they sinned by going after Satan so the question is though are we separate from these other humans that will exist, are there humans that exist? Are they all just in the man or in the glorified bodies, and then some fall away? I don't. I literally, I don't know. It's it's a tricky concept for me to grasp. Yeah. Um, there's a there's a, we're gonna this is gonna get be pretty deep as we as we ponder this, these questions coming up here. Uh, your point about the millennium, you have all kinds of time frames. Um, you have what happened in heaven with the angels? You know, happened with what, what happened with Adam and Eve at the fall? You what have what happened at the millennium, and with the rebellion, and then you have what's what we have to look forward to in eternity on the new earth, uh, and, and when we, we we've all claimed at the beginning we both said no. The answer is no. There will be no more sinning because the scripture does say there will be death, no more death, no more sin, so on. So there will be no more sin. We know that, but. Uh, the question here is, uh, if Adam and Eve did it in a sinless environment, uh, why, why do you think that uh, it's not possible um, in, on the new earth? So we'll, we'll, this is going to be a very interesting uh, subject as we go forward here. Uh, Jackson, do you have anything, any first reaction to this? Yeah, I, it reminds me of this one thing I heard. I heard Jack Smack say about Jesse Morrell saying that if somebody sinned in heaven they'd be kicked out and that they would go to hell after that or whatever. So I would really like to prove that it's not even <clears throat> possible to sin there and everything. Yeah. yeah. Well, also included is that if we did manage to somehow there'd be a faulty a fault in the system again, we if we lost salvation from that, like I know the wages of sin is death, so Technically, that would mean that somehow there's going to be some penalty somewhere along the line. But if we lost our salvation, then it would refute the idea of eternal security. So that can't be the case. Oh, that yeah. can't be the case for more reasons than just that. I'm just saying it'd be nice to, to, to be able to prove we can't sin at all in the first place. Okay, well, we're going to go into great depth on this, so brace yourself. Okay. Uh, it says, it's true that Satan tempted them, Adam and Eve. But he too originally was a perfect being living in a perfect environment beholding God himself. Not only was there no sin in heaven, there was no sin in the universe, yet Satan sinned. Hence, heaven's perfection, it seems, doesn't guarantee there will be no future sin. Um, yeah, I so, think that's a million dollar question is how did, how did Lucifer come into the sin knowledge. Yeah. Somebody said that he the the reason why he's the light bearer, the one who was illuminated, was that God gave him more knowledge and then he he used it for the wrong reasons. But even still it's it's hard to I think that's the million dollar question is how did the fall first start with with him because it go that's traced all the way back to that fall from because if sin never entered through him it would never have entered the world. I've got an answer. I'm not sure that it's the right answer. Uh, I, I, I think it is, but uh, I'm going to save it. I'm going to make a note here. Uh, let me see. Uh, and after we're at the end, at the end of what Randy has to say about this in our discussion, I'll tell you what my answer is to see if see if it uh, maybe you guys come up with this throughout the discussion here. But so far, it's some pretty uh, heavy uh, questions to consider. Right. Uh, look! Look what happened with Satan. Look what happened with Adam and Eve. It was a sinless. It was a perfect environment, and yet there was a rebellion. Uh, some people also argue that being human demands free choice, and therefore we must have the capacity to choose evil in heaven. If that's true, then we could experience another fall. Clearly, this is a question of great importance. Yeah, no doubt. This is pretty key. Yeah. Okay, now his next question is, 
Then, then if, if that were right, this could end like the movie Invaders from Mars does, where he wakes up and he sees the same spaceship land as at the beginning. Yeah, like Twilight Zone, it, it keeps repeating itself. Mm -hmm. Boy, this is terrible. We better get the right news, otherwise this will almost it will destroy the faith for somebody in certain states. Yes, yeah. Um, well, you know, the, I know the three of us believe the scriptures, and it says that there will be no more sin, so right. uh, I'm confident uh, that's the case, but how do we understand it? And that's what we're going to explore. So the question now is, can we know we won't sin? Christ promises on the new earth, quote, There will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain, for the old order of things has passed away, Revelation 21.4. Since, quote, the wages of sin is death, unquote, Romans 6.23, the promise of no more death is a promise of no more sin. Those who will never die can never sin, since sinners always die. Sin causes mourning, crying, and pain. If those will never occur again, then sin can never occur again. You see the logical, uh, deductive logic that he is he's using here. If scripture tells us there will be no more death, or crying, or pain, or mourning, well, uh, that logically we have to say that there could not ever be another sin because sin causes death and the fall and, and therefore all those things would happen. So it's just kind of a, a, a logical uh, process to come to, the, to this conclusion uh, according to what he showed us so far. Uh, then he says, consider the last part of Revelation 21, 4. For the old order of things has passed away." Unquote. What follows the word for explains heaven's lack of death, mourning, crying, and pain. These are part of an old order of things that will forever be behind us. The sin that caused them will, no long, will be no longer. We need not fear a second to fall. Uh, it's kind of like uh, uh, how do we know there will be no more sin because uh, no more death because because the the Bible tells us so I mean uh, I believe the scriptures uh, to me I look at the the source for my my truth about God and theology I go to the scriptures that's the source for me like sola scriptura and and uh, when when the Bible says it then I just accept that that is so and so if we believe that then I think that for that reason we can just say uh, with confidence I don't need to worry that there's going to be another fall because if there was if there was uh, if we we ever sinned again then there would be death again uh, well that's uh, that's kind of like a logical argument uh, for it uh, what do you what's your reaction to that so far it's just a question that to take into account is that if that's truth, which, you know, pray to God that is the truth, the confusing part is how I don't understand why we would live with unsaved people if at the very end they were just deceived and then because the, technically they would still be able to sin. And I don't understand if, if they were able to sin the whole time, which will lead up to their destruction for them being deceived by Satan again. I don't understand why we would live why we would live with unsafe people for a thousand years, and I don't also understand why they would be capable of sinning, but we wouldn't be, because wouldn't we be fighting those people as it is? Because this the the flesh always fights the spirit, so since we'd be permanently in the spirit, wouldn't we wouldn't we be fighting those people? Well, for one thing, Austin, remember that we're saved and they aren't. With being saved comes sort of an insurance that the unsaved person doesn't have. No, absolutely. My question would just only be, why would we be living with unsaved people? I mean, but, I don't understand. One of, the things you said, one of the things you said, though, is how come they can sin and we can't? I think it's because of the new nature that we have. And they, they totally lack that because they're unsaved, even though they were born during the millennium. I'm, I'm trying to really restrain myself from telling you my conclusion because I don't want to 
I don't want to say it before we consider all these other things he has in the book that are interesting. So I'm, I'm trying to I'm trying to re use restraint and hold back, even though I'm anxious to tell you something. But uh, yeah, what uh, what Jackson said is that in the millennium you'll have the people who are survive the tribulation, go into the millennium, they'll be having children, and the population of the world will grow probably larger than it, it, it has ever been. Because for a thousand years, without any death, uh, the, the population was going to grow to amazing, uh, amazing uh, size. And then um, there's going to be a rebellion when Satan is released. Uh, but you and I, the, all the people who are... Uh, uh, helping to govern, uh, I believe it's going to be the saints, not only not only Israel, the the saved Jews, but I believe it's going to be us too. We're going to be like co-ruling with Christ on the in the millennium, but we're glor have glorified bodies and we will uh, we will not have a sin nature. But the people who are born in that millennium, they they don't have glorified bodies. They're not indwelled with the Holy Spirit and sealed and and then re re uh, resurrected. So they're different beings. That's why they can sin, and we can't. Uh, really fast, though, would salvation still be the same then for them, since they're still in the flesh, simply faith alone? Because if it's been faith alone since the beginning of time, it would probably be faith alone to the very end of whatever goes on. Uh, your question kind of uh, uh, opens up. Uh, if I answer that, that's going to open up the... Uh, what the subject I'm holding back going to. Okay, I'll wait till you get, till your answer. That's a very good, very good. Uh, let's let me make a note of that. Let me see, millennium, millennium. And, and just one thing, also, I, I'm trying to grasp is that so everybody that makes it to the trib would have the hardest way. Well, no, because this is also confusing because I'm almost convinced now too is that if you're in the trib. You, it, you know, Jesus Christ said, "If you endure to the end." Well, technically, if salvation was all the same, wouldn't it be the same through the trib too? Why would the trib only be the hardest part of the way of salvation? Well, um, I, I, I'm not uh, one of those people that believes that people get saved differently uh, in the past, present, and future. I think it's always been solely by faith in God to save us. And, and now we know that God is Jesus Christ who died for our sins and rose from the dead. We know more about him. We know who he is and what he did. But it's always been faith in God to save us instead of uh, uh, anything else. Uh, and I think that's going to be the case also in the millennium. Uh, I mean, I'm in the tribulation. And what about the mark of the beast and, and uh, how they treat the Jews and these, these things that people say, well, these are two things that are going to be required in the tribulation in addition to faith. You've got to, you're going to be the sheep and the goats will be separated by how, how they helped the Jews during the tribulation. And then also, if they took the mark, they will be lost. So uh, uh, all I can say is that uh, uh, I don't think they're going to take the mark uh, when they get saved. They'll be, they'll be martyrs. Uh, instead, uh, I think they'll, because uh, I, I just can't see that anybody who's who's saved is going to have this as a uh, as a form of work. It's not going to be faith, faith plus work. But I know a lot of people. A lot of people think that you know, at least in the tribulation, uh, faith is not enough. Uh, there is a scripture that says uh, uh, they overcame him by the blood of the Lamb and the word of their testimony. And I, I be believe what that means is that uh, they, uh, when it says they overcame him, it, him is referring to Satan, the Antichrist. They overcame him by the blood of the Lamb, in other words, by putting their faith in Jesus uh, as their Savior, his, his sacrifice for their sins. They did that and the word of their testimony. In other words, they were willing to die they were willing to die. Uh, their testimony was, uh, "I believe in Jesus and cut off my head if you must." But uh, but a lot of them will be hiding out. There will be martyrs, but there are a lot of people hiding out that will endure to the end of the tribulation and make it in. Otherwise, there will be nobody to be uh, live in the millennium and give birth to all these new people in the millennium. Yeah, that's the last thing that I'm trying to grasp. So these people would still have the right to have sexual relations and conceive children and everything, but yeah. everybody that was raptured out don't have those abilities now? Yeah, that's correct. 
Are Never. you sure they don't have those abilities? I always thought it was possible we'd go back to marrying for that time. Uh, well, the, it, the, the scripture doesn't say anything about that. But uh, I can't imagine us with our glorified bodies uh, uh, having marriage and sexually reproducing uh, offspring that are not resurrected. Um, so that just doesn't, uh, it, I don't, the scripture doesn't say one thing or the other. But it just doesn't make sense to me to do that. It'd be really nice to have a family den, though. It's kind of that's the one downside. A family what? I'm just saying it'd be nice to have a family during that time because you know you wouldn't have to worry about any evil and everything would be really harmonic and everything. But yeah, yeah, until the rebellion. Yeah, I'm not until someone shows me otherwise. I'm not convinced that we won't go back to be with our spouses during that time. Well, there's nothing in the scripture that speaks on it, so you can only guess. Uh, I, yeah. to me, I'm just saying until somebody can show me that be, if, that we will not go back to marriage during the millennium, I think that would be a very good possibility that we do, because partly because of what Austin just mentioned. Yeah. Now, me, I'm using the same kind of rationale to come to the opposite conclusion. Uh, until someone shows me that, uh, that I should think, agree with your position, then I, I think that uh, we won't. You see, we both we both come to the same conclu opposite conclusions based upon the same thing. There's nothing written about it. Mm hmm I'm so, just saying, since not, nothing is said about it, I wouldn't see that as ruling out because I don't think that we'll be excluded from anything during the millennium. Is what I've always thought. Yeah, yeah. just be like us being excluded from a good thing. Something along that line is a pretty big exclusion because that's I know that you know that's a really big thing, there, buddy, because. Everybody wants a relationship, and I mean something that we would be strained from for letting others. Well, remember, uh, remember, uh, everybody, uh, all of the uh, the saints that uh, got raptured or resurrected, uh, and then go on to the uh, help in, in the millennium period. We're glorified, resurrected beings. And our, our our desire for sex and marriage and families will probably not even exist at that point. We will, will our desires will be different, just like they will be in eternity. Do you think then that in eternity on the new earth that we're going to be having marriage and and children and so on? I don't think we'll be having marriage. Um, I don't know what 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 the rules will be sexually or whatever. Okay, well, we're gonna we're gonna get into that into a coming chapter anyway. But uh, the point is, why would why would we resurrected beings uh, be act differently in the millennium than we would in, in the in eternity? Well, because the millennium is back on this earth. Yeah, but in eternity we're back on this earth on the new earth. It's a new earth. Yeah, it's a new earth that's going to have yeah. some, some some similar definitely as we've been studying. But yeah. Also very different well, I just, uh, all I can say is that uh, I've never heard anybody even think of such a thing and you you're, you're interesting Jackson you come up with some things that nobody else thinks of <laughs> I, I like hearing your ideas but all of a sudden you have a new idea I've never considered before and my I give you my initial reaction mm -hmm. and my initial reaction is opposite of your conclusion and yet neither one of us have anything to support it up Right, right. I mean, this is an un, this is a totally unspoken thing. So yeah. Okay, let's move on to back to where we were. Um, uh, he says, uh, Scripture emphasizes that Christ died once to deal with sin, and will never again need to die. That's Hebrews chapter nine and ten. Uh, we'll have the very righteousness of God. That's in Second Corinthians. We won't sin in heaven. For the same reason God doesn't, He cannot sin. Our eternal, our eternal inability to sin has been purchased by Christ's blood. So we're getting back to this question: is that we were talking about before we got sidetracked on the millennium and stuff? Is is about will we be capable of sinning like like the angels did and Adam and Eve and the millennium or the rebellion? Will we be capable of sinning? And Randy is saying, no, we can, we will not be capable. It says. God cannot sin, and we will not have the ability to sin either. So, but, but just one thing, real fast, is that having a a normal relationship with the opposite sex wouldn't be a sin, though. No, it wouldn't. It wouldn't. Right, we're on a different topic, I think. 
I'm not, oh, I don't, sorry. I yeah. came in a little late. No, no problem. But I just, I think that that's, I don't think that Luke or Randy or anyone was trying to imply that it was. Um, well, I, I'm a little confused now. Did Jackson go back to the Malayman question again in sex or after we... Or is, Austin, Austin did. We were talking I mean, about sinning yeah. and he mentioned that that wouldn't be a sin for us to have a marital relation during the millennium. Yeah. And... Uh, and I was just clarifying that I don't think you were saying that it was. Or no, whatever. yeah, you're, you're right. And if 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 if, uh, if if it is part of God's plan for us to be married and 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 have have babies in the millennium, I don't think that's the case. But if God said that's uh, that part of the plan, I, that would not be a sin. It's not a sin now to have be married and have children. Uh, we're going to discuss, as I said uh, before, later on. There's another chapter specifically talking about marriage and children. Uh, so we're, we're going to get to that. But now let's get back to this basic question of will we even be capable of sinning on the new earth? Um, and he's saying that uh, then Christ died once for all the sin. He, he says there will never be a need for him to die again. So he's saying that is, that's a, a statement that tells us that therefore we will not ever sin again because otherwise there would be a need for him to die again for our sins. Right? Well, not necessarily because didn't he die for everybody in the millennial too? Well, I'm sorry, sorry. I know you're, you're you going to touch on when the, how the millennial will get saved and everything, but I was just saying too is that well, if, they're, if, they, if the need for them to be saved is still present, then he had to have died for their sins. Yeah, but, 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 but I'm talking about beyond the judgment now. You had the great white throne judgment, you had the Bema seat, you had the destruction of the universe and the earth, and then you have the recreation of the new heavens and the new earth, then you have the heaven coming down and becoming part of the earth, and we're living on the new earth in eternity. That's the scenario we're discussing at. Will we be capable of sinning at that time? Okay. My answer would be no initially, but... Yeah. Well, he's he's trying to give us verses that we, we can come to a logical conclusion uh, that to, to support that. Uh, then he says, quote, For by a single offering uh, he uh, has perfected for all time those who are being sanctified. That's Hebrews chapter 10. On the cross, validated by his resurrection, our Savior purchased our perfection for all time. It says perfected for all time. So according to Hebrews chapter 10 verse 14, he says he has perfected us for all time. And if that's the case, that's declaring right there that we will never sin again. Sure. That makes sense. So now we're getting into the questions of, okay, if we're never going to sin again, is it because we're not capable of sinning? Or is it because we, we, we choose not to sin ever again and we have the power to power over it? Okay, now he says, quote, Nothing impure will ever enter it, the, the New Jerusalem, nor will anyone who does what is shameful or deceitful, but only those whose names are written in the Lamb's Book of Life. The passage doesn't say, if someone becomes impure or shameful or deceitful, that person will be evicted. <laughs> There's an absolute contrast between sinners and the righteous. Uh, that Satan and evildoers are cast forever into the lake of fire uh, shows an eternal separation of evil from the new earth. Heaven will be completely devoid of evil, with no threat of becoming tainted. Three times in the final two chapters of Scripture, we're told that those still in their sins have no access to heaven and never will. Revelation chapter 21, chapter 27, and tw um, 21, well, actually, and 22. Evil will have no footing in heaven and no leverage to affect us. Okay. And then he also goes to Hebrews 9. It says, with an air of finality that Christ sacrificed himself to put away sin or to do away with sin. Sin will be a thing of the past. Uh Okay, let's let's compare this to times past here. Uh, uh, before the angels fall, did Christ die for their for their sins? And it, no, no. I I was thinking about that just the other night about 
why? Because uh, I was thinking about when James said, "Even the demons believe." And it made me realize is that, you know, all these pastors always tell you that, yeah, Jesus only died for human beings and everything. And I think that the reason why he didn't die for the, the fallen angels, the demons, and Louis for himself is because I think that he saw Jesus Christ as, you know, the, the top here. He's God Almighty. I, he, he understands why mankind sins. But I think that I know, I know that if you chisel it down, even on, like, the worst people, like, let's take an example – well, technically, we're all sinners, so we're all, you know, we're all guilty. But I'm not trying to make one person worse than another. Let me just use, for example, like Adolf Hitler. I think if you chisel it all the way down, you know, he'd still have a soul and he'd still have the emotion to love and <clears throat> to be truthful and everything. I think Jesus Christ saw that in mankind is that, you know, if he understood that, yeah, what we did was wrong, but that in Romans 5:8, and that while we were at sinners, Christ died for us. I think that he knew that if he got down to when we were being perfected, he knew that our true intentions were to serve him, and that sin just polluted with you know within our flesh, it caused us to fall, and that if we had no sin, we would still be in the right standings. But I think that with the demons and loose for himself is that if he went all the way back, these people intentionally, like if if he went all the way down, these people intentionally didn't want to serve God, and that. They, they wanted to completely do evil, and it was to, you know, to hurt him or just to inflict damage upon him. And I think that the reason why he didn't die for him is that if he went all the way down with understanding, these people didn't want to serve God. They just, they want, they hated him. They wanted to overthrow him. And I think the reason why he didn't die for him is simply that, is that with understanding, he knew that mankind still had that love and truth with residing in them. But with, with these demons, that since they were, or the angels, when they were made in, uh, made by God, I think that, you know, they were made with right intentions, but they deliberately voided those right intentions to serve Lucifer to try to overthrow the, the kingdom. So, I don't know, it's just an idea. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, I forgot it why I even asked the question about uh, angels. Uh, uh, let me see if I can remember if I repeat the question. Uh, the uh, Jesus, at the time that the angels rebelled, Jesus had not died for man's sins or angel sins or any uh, anybody's sins, right? Right. Uh, uh, and, and then at, at the time of man's fall in the garden, Jesus had not died for anybody's sins either at that point. Uh, and at the, now uh, we know that Jesus died for the sins of all men, all mankind who's ever lived, and that's settled now. So that's a different scenario uh, than that's unique uh, that didn't apply to uh, uh, all the people before the cross and all the and, and the angels. There was there was no payment for man's sins up to that point. Now now that that's done, uh, that's why Randy I think is using these verses. He died once and he will never necessary to die again. Now that he's done that. Uh, if it was necessary for him to do it again, the scripture couldn't say that if man was going to be capable of sinning in the future, uh, in eternity. That does make a good point. When Abraham believed God and it was counted to him for righteousness, was he kept out of the kingdom of heaven? Was he stuck in paradise until Christ died for his sins so he could get imputed righteousness? Because we know he was saved. This isn't a question, was he saved till then? But didn't he need Christ to die for his sins? Because we understand that we get the imputed righteousness of God by faith, but don't we need you know, the shed blood for the remission of sins? Don't we need to have Jesus Christ sacrifice in order to get... Who are you referring to? Abraham. The, this is just anybody that was saved prior to Christ's sacrifice on the cross. See, this is why I think understanding dispensations is so important. Like, there's even a verse in Psalms that says the, to pray that the Holy Spirit won't leave us, and obviously that never happens in this dispensation and everything. Yeah. Um, I think that, that when Christ died on the cross for our sins, timing was zero factor, which also, by the way, refutes the idea that Christ died only for our past sins, but not for the sins we've yet to commit before believing, which is what some heretics teach. But, like, there was no time uh, requirement or issue with the sins, and I think he died for everyone's sins in the Old Testament, and they went to heaven 
an account of that it happened despite it not happening yet. Remember, God isn't limited by time like we are. Right. But I just remembered that Abraham, from the story of Lazarus, the uh, rich man Lazarus, that Abraham was in paradise. He wasn't necessarily in heaven at the time. Well, uh, paradise is is um, um, is another name for heaven. Oh. Uh, and and uh, we discussed this a uh, long time ago in the beginning of the study of uh, of uh, of heaven that you had there's basically three heavens there's the initial heaven which was uh, paradise which was where the Old Testament saints were waiting for the blood sacrifice to be made and then once Jesus paid for everybody's sins he went down and took the people from paradise up into this intermediate heaven that we know that everybody is in now and then at some point after uh, after the uh, judgment and this and the uh, new heavens and new earth are created. Uh, that uh, intermediate heaven called the New Jerusalem will come and join the earth, be part of the, the new earth, uh, and that'll be the the eternal heaven and earth. Uh, so those are the three kind of stages of heaven. Right. Uh, I, mean, I had a question though. This was going to touch on that. The angels of the Taurus are kept in a separate place of torment and they've, they've always been there my question is if Lucifer would be the most wicked why would why would he be be free all this time and then these angels of Taurus didn't even have a chance they were just condemned on the spot and thrown in there in this like because I know that if the diagram if from what I remember it goes the angels of Tartarus and then it goes hell and then it goes lake of fire but the angels of Tartarus are already there so were they judged even before Lucifer was and what did they do uh, I, I can't I can't answer that I don't know enough about it to, to tell you right off the top of my head and, and, and it's it's going way off topic so I don't want to try to get into that I'm trying I've got to get through these next couple of pages here uh, to finish this whole question about will we be able to sin in the future so I, I, I regret I, I won't be let maybe in another discussion, we can, if you could make a note, we can discuss that and try to figure that out. Okay, now, his next question is, will we have free will in heaven? What's your, what's your answer to that before I read Randy's answer? I would say yes, but I'm under, I'm under the presumption that I don't believe that we'll have the option to sin if we want to or not. I don't, because I think that's literally, there's a, there's so many sins that people commit that, like, literally it's it's impossible to, to prevent from happening. So I think that, I don't even think it's an option to, to think that, well, we, I'm just choosing not to do it. I don't, I don't even think that, I think that it's just solely based on we get all that removed from us. And there's free will to, like, oh, I want to walk over here or over there, but I don't think there's free will in choosing to sin or not. Mm -hmm. So, uh, do you believe man has free will presently? Yes. Uh, and, and so, uh, you and Jackson both, you're not in this Calvinist camp where you think that uh, the total no. total inability of man, uh, you know, no. I, I, I'm, I'm not, not told I, I think I believe in a limited free will that man has. I don't believe that somebody's free to get rid of their salvation, if, even if they don't want it anymore, because God's uh, gift of eternal life is irrevocable. Yeah, but that's not a question of will. That's a question of changing your changing your a substance. You know, once you're born again, you're a, a new creature. You you have that's not a choice. A question of will. If you've been changed into a new creature. Uh, so that's not a, ch a choice of will, but I agree with you that we cannot give back our salvation just because we say, I don't want it anymore. Uh, but, okay, so we all agree that man has free will, uh, and we don't, we don't hold on to the total inability uh, uh, of TULIP. Uh, and and, and that's, uh, that gets closer to what I want to talk about in the end here, but first... Okay, so you believe that we have free will now, but you do not think man will have free will in eternity uh, when it comes to sin. He will not have the, the, 
the free will to sin or not sin. Yes. I think how it'll be too is it'll be exactly before the fall from Adam and Eve in the garden. They had the free will to do everything, but they didn't have the knowledge of doing evil. I think that'd be what it is. God will remove the knowledge or revoke the knowledge of evil. So we'll have free will. It'll be the same thing, but we won't even know how to sin or how to do wrong. I don't I don't agree that he'll revoke the knowledge of evil because I think the part of the thing that we'll be able to enjoy so much about heaven is knowing how bad the world was before all of this. Yeah. So I, I can't agree with that statement. Well, I mean, you can just see how interesting to try even uh, ponder these questions is. But uh, um, Randy says, some people believe that if we have free will in heaven, we'll have to have to be free to sin, as were the first humans. But Adam and Eve's situation was different. They were innocent, but they had not been made righteous by Christ. We, on the other hand, ha uh, other hand, become righteous through Christ's atonement. For just as through the disobedience of one man the many were made sinners, so also through the obedience of the one man the many will be made righteous. Romans 5:19. To suggest we could have Christ's righteousness yet sin is to say Christ could sin. God completely de delivers us from sin, including vulnerability to sin. Yeah, see, I don't think it would be an option to be able to. So... Uh, so then we won't have we won't have free will in that in that respect. Then, okay, let's go on. Uh, even now we may quote participate in the divine nature and escape the corruption in the world caused by evil desires. Second Peter, in heaven there will be no evil desires and no corruption, and we will fully participate in the sinless perfection of God. What does this mean in terms of human freedom? Some people suggest our free choice is a temporary condition for the present life and won't characterize us in heaven. But it seems to me that the capacity to choose is part of what makes us human. It's hard to believe God would be pleased by our worship if we had no choice but to offer it. It's one thing for him to, be, uh, for him to enable us to worship. It's another for him to force us to do so or to make it automatic and involuntary. Christ woos his bride. He doesn't fix her, so she has no choice but to love him. What's your reaction to that? Well, this is almost going along the guidelines if it's possible to get mad at God. Now, if that's well, the case, wouldn't that be a sin? If someone's ticked off at God and they're saying, "I'm not going to worship you or anything," wouldn't that be like a red flag? Wouldn't that be, you know, an o like an overthrow or something? Well, you're you're uh, you're, you're willing to to say that um, God has changed us this in a way so we no longer have free will. And Randy, and I happen to agree with this, is that if, if we uh, our free will is taken away, then we are no longer human. And we're nothing but puppets and robots. And, and I don't think God um, wants us that way in the future. I don't think he made us that way originally, as as this Calvinist believes, that we're only puppets and robots and, and that God, God makes us do everything. We don't have any free will. So if, if the idea of, of uh, no free will uh, is, uh, is abhorrent to you now for the, that reason, then I think it should also be abhorrent to you equally in eternity uh, to believe that God would take away our free will and now we're just zombie puppets, you know, robots uh, with, with no ability to, to, to choose. It's not, no, no, I, I never said we won't have free will. I just don't see it as possible that we'll have the option to do wrong. Because it would, it would be with that time, would, <clears throat> excuse me, we'd have to be thinking about it constantly. We'd have to be making sure, oh, wow, did I do everything right? Because, you know, if, if, we, if it's possible that we don't sin, we won't die, so it means we can never sin. And we well, have free will to choose what? if we want to. That would mean we'd have to be constantly thinking, oh, wow, did I do everything right all the time? 
Well, let's let's get back let's get back to what he said here because we, we didn't discuss this enough. I don't think a previous statement I said. He says earlier to suggest we could have Christ's righteousness yet sin is to say Christ could sin. So the difference is, uh, did did Jesus have the free will to sin if he wanted to? Yeah. Okay, if you believe he had the free will to sin, and yet he never sins, and then we are going to be like him, then why could not we have the free will to sin, but ch but just choose not to because we have his righteousness? Yeah, but it was terrible when he was on the earth for not sinning. It's not to show that not sinning is bad, but it, it was, I mean, it was constant agony that he had to make sure and perfect everything was true. I mean, he there's no. It was literally almost no rest. He had to keep constant prayer, relationship would be fine. He had to love everybody. He could only speak the truth. And all these things but are now, like they're wonderful to say, but they're a heavy burden to think if we have to keep doing that. Well, now, not, that was not, if, not if it just comes that. naturally to him because of who he is, and he, he is righteous. If he's righteous, uh, and, and then we also have his righteousness in eternity, then, then we should be able to uh, uh, choose not to sin, just as he chose not to sin. And I don't, I never thought that Jesus like struggled in. You know, I thought you say agony or torturous or something that for him to have to go without sinning. I, I don't, I don't know how you came up with that. It does talk about Jesus being tempted, though. Yeah, tempted. I don't think he has temptation. I don't think he will ever want to sin in heaven. Like there's. Okay, we're going to get into temptation a little bit too. Okay, well, so just, if we I run um, real fast, if we had the knowledge to sin, wouldn't we be the same as Lucifer then? Because he had the he was given the knowledge of sin and he fell. But then, if we still have the knowledge of everything wrong, but we just ch choose not to, how? What's the guarantee that we can never do that? Because I know Lucifer is made the perfect image of God as well. I mean, he wasn't never made to sin, but if well, he... Well, the, gar the guarantee is is all of the, the dots that he's connected so far in this study. Randy says, scriptures say there will be no more death, no more sorrow, no more crying, no more pain. And, and then he also says that uh, sin uh, causes death, and, and sin causes all those other things. So therefore, uh, you have to conclude that... If there will be no more death or sorrow, then there can never be any more sin. You just have to come to that conclusion. And so how is that possible? Is it because God turns us into robots and we're not able to, to sin? Or, or is it because we have Christ's righteousness and therefore uh, we don't want to sin? We don't, we don't want to, and it's not even a temptation to us because we have his righteousness. Well, if we knew the knowledge of it, wouldn't that be a sin already? Because if no, we ever thought about no, it, was... no, that's not a sin. How is that a sin? God, I'm God, Jesus has the knowledge of sin. He, it doesn't mean he sinned. I don't know. This it's just too hard for me to grasp on this one. Yeah. All right. Um, let's go on. Um, so, what does this mean in terms of human freedom? That's the point that Randy's making, and this is a big point to me in terms of. Uh, you know, the difference between sovereignty of God and free will of man. I believe in the free will of man. Uh, God's sovereign in this respect. Not that he controls everything we do, because if God controlled everything Jackson did, when Jackson sinned, it's because God made him sin, therefore God becomes the sinner. God's and the that, one that can be believe, too. Yeah, so that's, that's the problem. With that God it. caused sin, which is that's, weird. Yeah, that's the problem is they take sovereignty of God to such an extreme that he's actually doing the thing, not you. And therefore, you can plead to God and say, I'm not guilty. God, you're the one that's guilty because you're the one that made me do it. So mm -hmm. there's where the argument for Calvinistic sovereignty falls apart. I think the sovereignty of God is God is able to do everything, but he that's, he's sovereign in that he's able to control everything he wants to. But he doesn't exercise control. He gives us free will even though he's able to control us if he wanted to. That's sovereignty. Okay, I'm not so, a Calvinist. Yeah? I'm just saying I'm not a Calvinist. Oh, I know you're not. I know you're not. Uh, imagine a husband who desires his wife's love, and to ensure that love, he injects her with a chemical to remove her free will, to make her love him. 
This is not love. It's coercion. Once we become what the sovereign God has made us to be in Christ, and once we see him as he is, then we'll see all things, including sin, for what they are. God won't need to restrain us from it. Sin will have absolutely no appeal. It will be literally unthinkable. And I think this is, this is uh, the only way that makes sense to me. If we're never going to sin, it's not because God makes us robots and incapable of sin. It's just that we see sin as just something none, not attractive at all. and it, We have no interest in it. We would never choose to sin be, and, and, uh, because oh, we're righteous. Um, uh, and then he goes on to say, the inability to sin doesn't inherently violate free will. My inability to God, uh, to be God, an angel, a rabbit, or a flower is not a violation of my free will. It's the simple reality of my nature. My new nature that'll that'll be ours. Uh, the nature, the new nature that'll be ours in heaven. The righteousness of Christ is a nature that cannot sin any more than a diamond cannot be soft or blue can be red. God cannot sin, yet no being has has greater free choice than God does. Uh, that's an interesting thing. Uh, I saw Brain Audi do a video years ago on this, and that is, um, is it God cannot sin? Do you believe God cannot sin? She says, no, I don't believe God cannot sin. I God, God can sin because God is, is um, uh, omnipotent. He can do whatever he wants, but he chooses not to sin. He does not want to sin, so he doesn't. And uh, I happen to agree with that. I don't think God it, God is incapable of sin. It's just that he would never sin because he doesn't want to. If he wanted to, he could. He's, he's God. Uh, uh, and it's, it, if that's the case, then we will be like him in that respect, isn't it? Uh, uh, yeah, we could we could sin, but we can't, we can't sin because we just don't... Uh, we have the righteousness of Christ, and therefore the appeal of sin, or the power of sin, has no power over us anymore. Um, I think he's got the right uh, way of seeing this here, and, but it's, isn't it interesting? And when you really start asking these questions, you know, uh, this whole thought process. Uh, then his next question is, Will we ever be tempted? Um, do you think we will? Well, I say no. I have to say no, too. Okay. He says, uh, will we be tempted to turn our backs on Christ? No. What would, what would tempt us? Innocence is the absence of something, sin, while righteousness is the presence of something, God's holiness. God will never withdraw from us his holiness. Therefore, we cannot sin. We'll never forget the ugliness of sin. People who have experienced severe burns aren't tempted to walk into a bonfire. Having known death and life, we, will, we who will experience life will never want to go back to death. We'll never be deceived into thinking God is withholding something good from us or that sin is in our best interests. Satan won't have any access to us, but even if he did, he wouldn't be tempt we wouldn't be tempted. We'll know not only what righteousness is, but also what sin is. Or um, oh yeah, skip that. Okay, so that's the point is that uh, we won't have any temptation because the tempter won't be there. In eternity, will we have the devil? Will we have the demons tempting us? No. No. Will we have other other uh, beings tempt us? No. No, because everybody is righteous, and therefore Jackson's not going to be tempted me because he he's, he has the has the righteousness of Christ. Therefore, why would he? He's not capable of tempting me. He's only going to be encouraging me to do good things and. So uh, uh, now, next question is: Will we really be perfect in eternity? What do you think? Yes. Yes. 
Okay. Someone emailed me this question. Quote, in heaven, will some people still be annoying? <laughs> After all, eternity is a long time. Annoyance is sometimes caused by others' sin, not our own or both. Since sin will be eliminated, so will annoyance. That doesn't mean people won't have idiosyncrasies, only that they won't be rooted in sin, and none of us will uh, degrade or dismiss others. Jonathan Edwards said, Even the very best of men are on earth imperfect, but it is not so in heaven. There shall be no pollution or deformity or offensive defect of any kind seen in any person or thing, but everyone shall be perfectly pure and perfectly lovely in heaven. Okay. That has been really fascinating. We've completed that. Uh, when we go next time, we'll start with chapter 32, and it'll talk about what we will know and learn in heaven. Uh, but first, now let me go back to what I made on my note originally. I wanted to hold back till the end here and pose a, a final question to you. Something that I've concluded, my, just as my own conclusion about uh, um, what God really wants and desires of, in his creation. Uh, and that is free will beings who love him. Uh, God did not make us as robots the way a Calvinist believes because uh, it, it would not be true love. If God programmed you so that you loved him, it, it, it's not love. It's, it's, a, it's a program. It's not, love can only be true love if a person wants, wants to love someone and, and chooses to, to do it. Uh, so if God is love and he wants to love us, and he wants us to love him in return, he had to give us free will in order to choose to love him or choose to reject him. And so this free will choice, I think, is the theme of all eternity for all, all beings. I mean, all, all these angels, man, millennium, and everything. And this is how I see it played out. The angels live with God, and, and yet uh, they had to... Uh, be given a choice. Well, when Satan Satan made it, was the first to make the choice, decide he wanted to be his own god, and he wanted to, to so he rebelled and be, de declared independence from God. He didn't want to be under God; he wanted to be equal and become his own god. And therefore, then 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 there was a choice that had to be made. All the angels had to choose, and some chose to go with Lucifer and go their own way and try to become gods themselves and others chose to stay with God and love him and worship him. That, that free will choice that those angels made to stay with God is what gave them this, this, it, this status. They made the choice to choose God, therefore it's true love. The same thing had to happen with man. So with Adam and Eve, uh, they were also in a position where they were tempted and had to choose. Would they choose to believe God or would they choose to believe the serpent? God said, uh, don't eat from that tree of knowledge of good and evil or you'll surely die. And Lucifer said, that's not true. You won't surely die. You'll just be like God. So Adam and Eve made a choice and they chose to declare dependence from God and go their own way and take from the fruit and become like God, their own, become their own gods. Uh, so they rebelled against God. They were given a choice. And then, of course, we, I think we all agree that Adam and Eve repented and regretted what they did and got uh, restored to God uh, by believing in him again. And, 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 and then... Uh, because of Jesus dying for their sins, I think Adam and Eve are probably saved. Uh, but what had to happen was they had to make this choice, otherwise there is no love unless you are free to choose it. They were free to choose to, to be with God or to rebel and go their own way. Now, every one of us has to make that choice. Every person has to choose, and 
Jackson, what did you choose? Did you choose Jesus or did you choose to, to go your own way? Well, um, I kind of hesitate to say I chose Jesus in terms of what Bob Wilkins said in the James White debate about the being convinced or not convinced of believing something, you know. Okay. Uh, I also think that that is, uh, uh, that's, that's very true. Like some people will argue that you cannot choose to believe. And I, I happen to think that we, we cannot choose to believe. We just become convinced at a certain point. And then, and then all of a sudden we find that we believe. Right. Well, we can choose, those whether to fairly investigate the evidence or not. Is yes. What I would say. Yes. Okay. But, 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 but once you're convinced, you, you, you came to this realization and yeah. said, I, I, I want Jesus and, and I don't yeah. want to go my own way. So you, you were um, in this, this situation where you could have rejected Jesus or you could, you, instead you believed and now you're convinced. I did the same thing, Austin did the same thing, and then we, so now, all mankind had to make this choice, otherwise, uh, for some reason, God wants us, every person, to make a choice. That's why I believe, in the millennium, after a thousand years, Lucifer is released. I used to wonder, why in the world, when everything's going so good, the millennium, the description of the millennium is wonderful, why would God release the devil? And I believe that it's because uh, those people in the millennium never had to make a choice. There's only one choice for them. It's Jesus. So God released Satan. Now they could choose Satan or they could choose Jesus. Mm -hmm. And the same thing is true. Uh, hang on one second. Yeah? I'll be out in a few minutes. Okay. Uh, so I think that's why... The uh, uh, in the millennium, the Satan's released is because these people never made a choice in the millennium. They, everybody has to be get be in a situation to make the choice. So some will choose Jesus, some will rebel and, and choose Satan in the millennium. Now, once we've made that choice, though, to be with God instead of going our own way. Now we know that then we he we give he gives us glorified bodies he resurrected we have the resurrection the 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 righteousness of Christ and now there's no longer a need for uh, this this choice anymore now we have a new nature and we have uh, the righteousness of Christ and therefore our desires are totally changed and we we don't even have the desire or interest the the thought of wanting to sin is the last thing on our mind because we're like Christ we're not omnipotent. We're not omniscient, we're not omnipresent, we're not God, but we're like Christ in that we have righteousness. But, and we can never lose it because what we've already made that choice. We don't have to continue to make the choice over and over again. Once we've made the choice, we're regenerated, and then we get resurrected. So that's I, how I, think. I agree, Luke, that the regeneration precedes faith, which is something that some people, or sorry, that faith precedes regeneration. I said that backwards, which is yeah. what some people argue against. Yeah, I agree with that. Okay, uh, unless you want to respond to what I just said, that's my explanation of why man's always, and even angels, were given a choice. And then Adam and Eve were given a choice. And then we, we were, fallen man was given a choice to trust God or not. And now we, our choice in this dispensation is to trust Jesus, know that Jesus is, is our Savior God. Uh, and then the millennium, they have to make a choice. So it's all about choosing. Are you going to go some other way? Or are you going to put your faith in God instead? Um, now, if you don't want to respond to that, let's, uh, let's close the show for tonight. Anything, anything you want to say about that? No. Okay then. Uh, we'll pick up with the next chapter next time. But now, for now, let's just tell the people uh, that now, uh, if they're interested in going to heaven, uh, if if you're watching this video now and you're saying, "Wow, this heaven sounded really good. Uh, I want to go. What do I have to do, uh, brother Brother Jackson? Uh, if someone is wondering now, what do I have to do to go to heaven? What 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 would you say to them? Well, you know, the Bible says in, in the book of 2 Corinthians not to let anybody uh, take you away from the simplicity that is in Christ. It's a very, very simple message. See, Jesus Christ was the Son of God and God the Son, 
and was sent to earth and was crucified for our sins. He died on the cross, he was buried, and he rose again from the grave three days later after he had died. Believing on him, which means putting your trust in him and what he did for you, is all the only requirement of going to heaven. It's free, it's paid for entirely by him. Mm -hmm. That sounds two two things strike me on that. It sounds like really good, and it sounds really simple. Both are very uh, accurate descriptions of it. Yeah, it sounds like really good news because you're not putting any burden and responsibility on me. You're saying Jesus has done it all. Jesus is the is it's it, the burdens for salvation is entirely on Jesus. I just need to trust Him completely and no longer put my faith in my own ability, but instead put my faith in Him. And, and in doing that, he gives me eternal life in heaven as a, as a free gift. There's, there's no strings attached to it. Precisely. And I wish people would listen more to the words of the older hymns. You know, Jesus paid it all, all to him I owe. Not mm -hmm. Jesus paid in part. Part, I'll repent of my sins and make up for the gap there. That's not mm -hmm. in it. Okay. Amen. You did an excellent job of explaining that, Brother Jackson. I want to ask Brother Austin if there's anything he wants to add to this. I mean, uh, just it's a free gift, bought and paid in full. The gospel is our receipt. The blood is the payment. And it's just offered to all by simply believing on the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, we'll do Romans 10, 13. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. And Jesus Christ said in John 6, 47, Verily, verily, I say unto you, He that believeth on me hath everlasting life. And I'll give you one more assurance. You can know you're going to heaven. Uh, people, the, the, verse I gave, the verse I gave you before are assurance too, but people like the word know. Uh, 1 John 5.13 says that. Dearly beloved, I write these things to you that believe upon the name of the Son of God, that ye may know that you have eternal life, and that ye believe upon the name of the Son of God. Mm -hmm. Amen. Uh, the only thing I will uh, want to emphasize, I think we've, we kind of mentioned this, but I'd like to emphasize this to anybody who's watching. Two things I really want you to understand about this, this uh, the, the gift of salvation that Jesus is offering you right now. Uh, one is the exclusivity. In other words, you can't get it through anybody else. You can't get it through Muhammad or Buddha or the Pope or the Virgin Mary. And you can't get it through your own personal merit. It, this is offered exclusively through Jesus Christ. And, and the second thing is entirety. It, it must be and your faith must be entirely on Him, and nothing else. Don't don't think that Jesus uh, it will do it, but you've got to do your part too, because then you're you're nullifying what Jesus has done and saying what He what he, His power is not enough, His promise is not enough. I've got to do my part. If you do that, then you basically frustrate Jesus and cancel out this gift. So you must just accept the fact that uh, you have nothing to do with it. Jesus does it all, and and that uh, and that there is no other way. You can't get this is salvation any other way through your own merit or any other way. And you need Jesus. He's the only Savior, God. So if you do put your faith in Jesus today, please make a comment on this video, because we would love to know about it, and we will celebrate. So thank you for watching. Bless you all in the name of our great Savior God, Jesus Christ.